this week in environmental science we'll be taking a look at chapter 6 and we'll revisit the concepts of population but this time looking strictly at human population and how it affects the earth's environment here's our objectives for this week the lecture will help us understand human population growth population affluence and technologies effects on the environment demography along with demographic transition and other factors affecting population growth. Our central case study involves China. The People's Republic of China is our world's most populous nation, home to one-fifth of the more than seven billion people living here on Earth. And it's also the site of one of the most controversial social experiments in history. Hence, it becomes our case study in this chapter. After a certain war, China was an impoverished nation and leaders encouraged population growth by having many children and by 1970 improvements in food production, food distribution, and public health allowed China, China's population to swell to 790 million people. And at that time, the average Chinese woman gave birth to an average of 5.8 children in her lifetime. However, the country's population, which was overgrowing and industrial and agricultural development, were eroding the nation's soils and depleting the water and polluting the air. Realizing the nation might not be able to continue to feed its people or to continue to have such high population growth, Chinese leaders in 1970 decided to institute a population control program that prohibited most Chinese couples from having more than one child. This was mostly for urban couples. Families on farms were allowed to have more than one child due to needing more labor on a farm. The program began the outreach efforts encouraging couples uh, to marry later and to have fewer children. Along with those lines, the Chinese government increased the accessibility of contraceptives and abortions. And by 1975, the population growth rate, in average with China, had dropped from 2.8% to 1.8%. In 1979, then the government began rewarding the one-child families with better jobs, housing, and medical care in schools, while putting fines towards people who had more than one child, and also they would face social scorn. The experiment was actually a success, though, in slowing down the population growth of China. The rate today is actually down to 0.5% on average. And so an average Chinese woman now would only have 1.5 children in her lifetime. However, solving one problem seems to have given birth to another problem. Today, China has a shrinking labor force and number of elderly people is growing and also there's too few women with families being limited to just one child, many Chinese couples have preferred a son to a daughter because sons carry on the family name. So tragically, this has led to selective abortion and the killing of female infants in, in China and has also led to black market trade of teenage girls and led to uh, a higher ratio of young men versus women in China. This can lead to social instability that arises when large numbers of young men are able, unable to find brides and then remain longtime bachelors. China's reproductive policies have long elicited intense criticism worldwide from people who oppose government intrusion into personal reproductive choices, but it has proven highly effective in slowing growth rates. And as other nations like India become more crowded and wish to emulate China's economic growth, might their governments also feel forced to turn to drastic policies that restrict individual freedoms? In this chapter, we'll examine human population dynamics worldwide and consider their causes, 
and assess their consequences for the environment and our society. China receives a great deal of attention with regard to population issues because of those unique pr reproductive policies and its status as the world's most populous nation. But China is not alone in struggling with population matters. India soon will surpass China in possessing the world's largest population. India was the first nation to implement comprehensive population control policies. But when India's policymakers introduced forced sterilization in the 1970s, the resulting outcry forced the government to change its policies. And since then, India's efforts have been more modest and less coercive than China's. They focus more on family planning and reproductive health care. But like India, many of the world's poorer nations continue to experience substantial population growth. And those nations are often not able to handle such growth. And then that leads to stresses on society and the environment and the people's health and well-being. In our world now of more than 7 billion people, one of our greatest challenges is finding ways to slow population growth, probably not by such coercive me uh, methods as China did, but finding ways to establish conditions that lead people to desire to have fewer children. Our population grows by over 80 million each year. It took until about 1800 to reach 1 billion, then 130 more years to reach 2 billion, and only 30 years to reach 3 billion. And the human population continues to grow exponentially, and that's 3 billion in the last 12 years. Remember that exponential growth is the increase in a quantity by a fixed percentage per unit time. Also, did you know that by adding over 85 million people each year to our planet, this would be equivalent to adding all the people of California, Texas, and New Jersey to the world annually? So that actually means we add more than two people to the planet every second. At today's 1.2% global rate, the population will double in 58 years. Our highest growth rate is actually in developing countries, and often that might mean also our poorer countries who aren't equipped to handle such population growth. And this can be a problem. Technology, sanitation, better medication and being able to have more food and agriculture increase population by reducing infant mortality rates. That's the rate at which infants die. That uh, drops the death rate, but not the birth rates. So populations continue to grow because of our better technology, sanitation, medication, and agriculture. Environmental scientists have tried to pin a number on what the actual carrying capacity for people is on Earth. Remember that carrying capacity is the total number of a population that an ecosystem, or for people, that the Earth can actually support. These numbers are usually different and it depends on whether you want the people to be prosperous and have a lot of items and wealth. So they say about one to two billion if everybody is prosperous. But could go as high as 33 billion, but the people living then would not have a lot of wealth and would not have a lot of food. They'd be very poor. So possibly somewhere in between there would be the carrying capacity. British economist Thomas Malthus, who lived from 1766 to 1834, argued in his influential work, an essay on the principle of population in 1970, or 1798, that if society did not reduce its birth rate, then rising death rates would reduce the population through war, disease, and, and starvation. 
although his thoughts were reasonable at the time, we've had agriculture improvements and medical improvements that have helped humans increase the carrying capacity for people on Earth. Paul Ehrlich wrote a work called The Population Bomb in 1968 predicting similar things such that the population growth would lead to famine and conflict. However, thanks to the way of the green revolution and increased food production and agriculture in developing regions decades after his book, Ehrlich's forecast didn't fully materialize. So, does this mean human innovation will always find a way to support our population? Well, some economists feel that resource depletion is actually not a problem as long as we can come up with new resources, but in contrast, environmental scientists recognize that not all resources on Earth can be replaced once they're depleted. For example, once a species is extinct, we can't always bring it back and we cannot replicate its exact functions in an ecosystem or know what benefits it might have provided us as humans. As the human population continues to climb, we may yet continue to find ways to raise our carrying capacity. Given our knowledge of population ecology and logistic growth, however, we can't presume that human numbers can increase forever. So, is continued human population growth a problem? To answer this, we must ask whether we could maintain the quality of life we desire even if resource substitution could hypothetically enable our population to grow indefinitely. Unless the availability and quality of all resources keeps pace forever with population growth, the average person in the future will have less space in which to live, less food to eat, and less material wealth than the average person does today. Thus, population growth is indeed a problem if it depletes resources and stresses social systems and degrades the natural environment, such as the quality of life decline. Population is just one of several factors that affect our environment. A handy, widely used formula gives us a way to think about population and these other factors and how they do impact the environmental quality. This is nicknamed the IPAT model. I is for the impact on the environment and would result from a combination of these things. Population, obviously individuals need space and resources so population would have an effect on the environment. Affluence is the per capita resource use, which would have an impact, and technology. This increases the use of certain things in the environment, but it could also protect resources as well. We could take this a step further and also factor in sensitivity, uh, such as uh, one area may be much more sensitive to to uh, population growth than another and other refinements could come from how well people are educated in an area, what laws they have in place and what ethics they hold. China is a window into what much of the rest of the world could soon become. Modern China's rapid development is causing unprecedented unprecedented environmental challenges. Intensive agriculture is eroding their farmland. Overuse of the water from the Yellow River is drying up parts of it. They're pumping out a lot of water from their aquifers and drying those up. Increasing numbers of vehicles causes more urban air pollution and massive traffic jams. One thing we must remember is that People do not exist in isolation, that we exist within our environment as one of many species and like all other species that we are subjected to the same natural forces as others that drive biological change in the natural world. It all applies to humans as well as other organisms. The application of principles 
from population ecology to the study of statistical change in human populations is the focus of demography. Demographers study population size, density, distribution, age structure, sex ratio, and rates of birth, death, immigration, and emigration of people, just as population ecologists study this with other organisms. Each of these characteristics help us predict population dynamics and environmental impacts. Our global human population is more than 7.1 billion now. It's spread among more than 200 nations. And here's a pie chart that we can actually see how our population is spread amongst these different nations, with China at the highest, 1.2. 357 billion, India coming in next. The UN predicts 9.3 billion humans by the year 2050. If women have just 0.5 uh, children fewer than the medium scenario, there would be 8, not 9.3 billion by 2050. Each of these lines on this chart shows a different rate of growth. Humans are unevenly distributed around the globe. Demographers, remember, study things like population density and distribution. Remember that humans are clumped in the way they're distributed. Clump is an uneven distribution. We tend to clump around places that have a lot of water or tend to have more mild climate. And we clump less in places like deserts or tundra that have more extreme temperatures. However, even though populations may not be so big in certain areas like deserts and arid grasslands and tundra, they can be actually more sensitive than some of the other areas where we are clumped and therefore would have a high S value for sensitivity in the iPad equation. They would be vulnerable to human activities like agriculture and ranching. Age structure describes the relative number of individuals of each age class within a population. These are, uh, this information is especially valuable to demographers trying to predict future dynamics of human populations. Age structure diagrams are often called population pyramids and are visual tools that scientists use to illustrate age structure. And uh, the width of each horizontal bar represents the number of people in each age class. A pyramid with a wide base denotes a large proportion of people who have not yet reached reproductive age. And this would indicate a prop population soon capable of rapid growth. In even distribution, it would remain stable and births would equal death. Here we can compare the population pyramids of Canada and Nigeria. When we take a look at Nigeria's base, it's very wide. They have a lot of pre-reproductive individuals, therefore indica indicating a higher growth rate, which is actually 2.8%. In Canada, the base is very narrow compared to the rest of the chart. Their growth rate is actually 0.4%. So not surprisingly, Nigeria has a higher population growth rate than Canada. Today, populations are aging in many nations, including the, the United States. The global mean age is now 28, but in 2050, it'll be 38. In China, the age structure is changing as well. In 1970, the median age was 20, but by 2050, it will be 45. This can obviously mean some problems with less individuals in the workforce, but could also have some benefits and there'll be some older, wiser people or retirees that can contribute 
volunteer time and experience toward productive efforts. Human sex ratios are another study area of demographers. Human sex ratios at birth slightly favor males. For every 100 females born, 106 males are born. This phenomenon is actually an evolutionary adaptation to the fact that males are slightly more prone to death during any given year of life. And it tends to ensure that the ratio of men to women will be approximately equal when people reach reproductive age. Thus, the slightly uneven sex ratio at birth is actually beneficial. However, with the better survival of human male babies and human males throughout their lives, it can lead to a greatly distorted ratio and then can therefore lead to problems. In recent years, though, demographers have witnessed an unsettling trend in China that the ratio of males to females is actually 120 boys reported for 100 girls. Some provinces have actually reported sex ratios as high as 138 boys for every 100 girls. The leading hypothesis for these unusual sex ratios is that some parents learn the gender of their fetus by ultrasound and selectively abort female fetuses. China's skewed sex ratio may lower population growth rates further. Already the scarcity of young women has led to intense competition among young men. And in parts of rural China, teenage girls are being kidnapped and sold to wealthy families as brides for single men. Many other Chinese men are being left single and then they find employment as migrant workers and this tends to lead to have them engage in more risky sexual activity and could actually make them more susceptible to HIV in China. Population change results from birth, death, immigration, and emigration. Rates of birth, death, and migration determine whether a population grows, shrinks, or remains the, the same. Birth and immigration will add individuals, while death and emigration will remove individuals. Technical, technological advances can decrease death rates, and it's increased the gap between birth and death rates that have resulted in population expansion. Many nations, as they industrialize, enjoy a decrease in infant mortality. This is due to better nutrition, prenatal care, and the presence of medically trained practitioners during birth. Here's a chart to show us infant, mort infant mortality rates around the world. We can see that it's highest in poorer nations such as Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's lowest in the wealthier nations. In recent decades, reductions in birth rates around the world have led to an overall decline in the global growth rates. But note, however, that although the rate of growth is slowing, the absolute size of our population continues to increase. Our growth rate is getting smaller, but tens of millions of people are added to the planet each year. Total fertility rate influences population growth. Total fertility rate, also called TFR, is the average number of children born to each female during her lifetime. Replacement fertility is the total fertility rate that keeps the population size stable and on average is a number of 2.1. That means two children will replace the mother and father and the extra 0.1 accounts for the risk of a child dying before reaching reproductive age. If the TFR drops below 2.1 and remains there, population size in the absence of immigration will shrink. Many things have driven TFR down. They include better medical care, which reduces infant mortality, urbanization, meaning that you don't need as many children to label, labor on a farm, has driven it down but it also increases child care costs and children go to school instead of working. 
some nations have implemented items like social security which supports the elderly so elderly people don't need as many children to support them in their old age and as women become more educated and have better medical care and enter the labor labor force they don't have as many children as they once did all of these factors have come together in Europe where TFR has dropped from 2.6 to 1.6 in the past half century nearly every European nation now has a fertility rate of that below the replacement level and populations are declining in 18 of 45 European nations in 2013 Europe's overall annual rate of natural increase which is also called the natural rate of population change uh, change due to birth and death rates alone excluding migration was between 0 0.0 and 0.1 percent worldwide by 2013 77 countries had fallen below the replacement fertility of 2.1 these countries would uh, make up roughly half of the world's population and include China their TFR is 1.5 Many nations have experienced the demographic transition. The demographic transition is a process in which a population moves from a pre-industrial stage of high birth rates and high death rates to a post-industrial stage of low birth rates and low death rates. As nations industrialize, they move from a stable pre-industrial state of high birth and death rates. To a stable post-industrial state of low birth and death rates. Industrialization decreases the mortality rates, so there's less need for large families and parents invest in a quality of life instead of a quantity of kids. Death rates fall before birth rates, resulting in temporary population growth. Here's a chart to help visualize demographic transition. In this area where there's a large gap between the birth rate and the death rate, this would be where your largest population growth would be. Here more at the beginning of the process rather than at the end or at the extreme beginning of the process where death rates are still high. Here's the four stages of the demographic transition. The pre-industrial stage has low population growth. There's still some high death rates because of disease, starvation, and few medicines. And there's still kind of a high birth mortality rate. In the transitional stage, you have higher population growth. And industrialization, increased food and medical care reduces mortality rates. But birth rates are still high, therefore population growth rate is high. In the industrial stage, population growth decreases because women start getting jobs and the use of birth control becomes more common and kids are not needed on farms as much to help produce food. In the post-industrial stage, the population stabilizes and there's low births and low death rates. Is the demographic transition a universal process? Demographic transition has indeed occurred in Europe, the US, Canada, Japan, and other nations over the past 200 to 300 years. But it may or may not apply to developing nations. The transition could fail. If the population is too large to allow the transition, or in cultures that place greater value on childbirth, or grant women fewer freedoms. They may not experience the same phases of demographic transition. For people of all nations to attain the material standard of living in, of North Americans, we would need the natural resources of three more Earths. Demographic transition theory links the quantitative study of how populations change with the societal factors that influence population dynamics. 
Here are some factors that affect fer fertility in a society. Public health factors, such as access to medical care and infant mortality rates. Cultural factors, such as religious traditions, the degree of gender equality and relative acceptance of contraceptive use. And then there's economic factors, level of affluence and degree of child labor and the availability of governmental support for retirees. Perhaps the greatest single factor enabling a society to slow its population growth is the ability of women and couples to engage in family planning. Family planning is the effort to plan the number and spacing of one's children. Family planning programs and clinics offer information and counseling to potential parents on reproductive uses issues. An important component of family planning is birth control. The effort to control the number of children that one bears. Birth control often relies on contraception, which is the deliberate prevention of pregnancy through a variety of different methods. This can be hindered by religious and cultural influences. Rates range from below 10% in Africa to 86% of people saying that they've used contraception in China. Access to family planning gives women control over what's called their reproductive window. This is the period of a woman's life beginning with sexual maturity and ending with menopause in which she could become pregnant. A woman can bear up to 25 children within this window. But with plan family planning, she could choose to delay the birth of a first child, possibly to pursue education or employment. She might use contraception to delay her first child or space births within the window and to close her reproductive window after achieving her desired family size. Family planning programs are actually working around the world. Funding and policies that encourage family planning lower population growth rates in all nations. In fact, in Thailand, they used an education-based approach to family planning, and it reduced its growth rate from 2.3% to 0.4%. Brazil, Mexico, Iran, Cuba, are some other developing countries that also have active programs. 1994's UN Population and Development Conference in Cairo, Egypt called for universal access to reproductive health care and to offer education and health care and address social needs. These bottom-up approaches have now become the norm for many nations population initiatives as opposed to China in the way they handled their population growth with their top-down approach. These bottom-up approaches act to lower population growth rates while avoiding social disruption. Here's some issues just for you to consider. Should we abstain from international family planning? The U.S. and a hundred other 180 other nations have provided millions of dollars to the United Nations Populations Fund, which advises governments on family planning, sustainable development, poverty reduction, reproductive health, and AIDS prevention. Should the United States fund family planning efforts in other nations? And what conditions, if any, should it place on the use of such funds? Again, those are some items to think about. Remember, I did say earlier that perhaps the greatest single factor enabling a society to slow population growth is the ability of women and couples to engage in family planning. Empowering women reduces fertility rates. A nation's fertility rate drops when women gain access to items such as contraceptives, family planning programs, and educational opportunities. Educating women reduces fertility rates, delays childbirth, and gives them a voice in reproductive decisions. 
In some societies, men restrict women's decision-making abilities, including decisions as to how many children they'll bear. Birth rates have dropped the most in nations where women have gained reliable access to contraceptives and to family planning, and this trend indicates that giving women the right to control their reproduction reduces fertility rates. Efforts to improve women's rights are enhanced when young women are exposed to empowered women they can emulate. These women can be relatives, friends, social workers, politicians, or even characters on television programs. In our science behind the story, environmental scientists asked, did soap operas reduce fertility in Brazil? Over the past 50 years, the South American nation of Brazil experienced the second largest drop in fertility among developing nations with large populations, second only to China. In the 1960s, the average woman in Brazil had six children, but today the fertility rate is 1.9 children per woman. There has been uh, many things that may have contributed to this. Brazil accomplished this in part by providing women equal access to education and opportunities to pursue careers outside the home. Women now comprise about 40% of the workforce in Brazil and graduate from college in greater numbers than the men. In 2010, Brazilians even elected a woman as their nation, nation's president. The Brazilian government also provides family planning and contraception to its citizens free of charge. 80% of married women of childbearing age in Brazil currently utilize contraception, which is actually a rate higher than that of the United States or Canada. Universal access to family planning has given women control over their desired family size and has helped reduce fertility across all economic groups from the very rich to the very poor. Induced abortion is not utilized in Brazil as it is in China. In fact, the procedure is actually illegal except in rare circumstances. It turns out, however, that Brazil may have also had another rather unique influence affecting its fertility rates over the past several decades, and that is soap operas. Brazilian soap operas, which are called telenovelas or novelas, are a cultural phenomenon and are watched religiously by people of all ages, races, and incomes there. Each novella follows the activities of several fictional families and are very widely popular because they have characters, settings, and plot lines with which everyday Brazilians can identify. Telenovelas don't actually promote birth control or family planning. Instead, they promote a vision of an ideal family which would be a middle or upper class family being materialistic or individualistic and are full of empowered women. The network that now reaches 98% of Brazilian households called Reedy Globo is the main network that shows telenovelas and so they were used to help this study. And here's some of the data that they gain by looking at the reaches of the network. Fertility declines were age related. Fertility reductions occurred in women's ages in women aged 25 to 44, but not in younger women. Women of these ages were closer in age to the main female characters in the telenovelas. Television's ability to influence fertility is not limited to Brazil. In the United States, tweets and global searches for terms such as birth control increased significantly the day following the airing of MTV's 16 and Pregnant, and MTV's Teen Mom series may be responsible for reducing teenage birth by up to 20,000 per year. The factors that affect human fertility can be complex and can, can, can vary from society to society. Although this correlative study does not prove causation, 
between watching telenovelas and reduced fertility, it does show that factors that influence fertility can sometimes come from unexpected sources. And it does reinforce the data about family planning and contraception and empowering women. Increasing affluence lowers fertility. Poor societies have higher population growth rates. Poverty and population growth make each other worse. 99% of the next billion people added will be born in poor, less developed regions that are less able to support them. Expanding wealth can increase the environmental impact per person. Affluent societies have enormous resource consumption with severe far-reaching environmental impacts and the ecological footprints are huge. One American has as much environmental, environmental impact as 3.4 Chinese or 8 Indians or 4, 14 Afghans. We must reduce population growth and consumption. For a high standard of living and quality of life for all, developing nations must slow their population growth. Their consumption is also increasing. Developed nations must slow their consumption. Our global ecological footprint is 50% more than the Earth can support. In conclusion, the human population is larger than it's ever been. Rates are decreasing, but populations are still rising. Most developed nations have passed through the demographic transition. Expanding women's rights slows population growth. How will population stop rising? Well, the demographic transition, governmental intervention, or de disease and social conflict could have its impact. 